I'm going to talk uh, today about something which I think is at the heart of what we do as scholars and increasingly in the uh, modern world, and that's to say something about the historic and the present connections between um, art and science. And I start with um, the, um, one of the images which, of course, you will all remember was part of our um, uh, 300th anniversary exhibition. It's the making of the remaking of the face of Richard Brandon, the executioner of Charles I, um, the skull of whom resides in University College Hospital, um, using um, new scanning uh, devices. Um, using these laser scans to manufacture the face in ways that we um, would have had to do with a careful building up of um, physical raw materials in the past. But I start with that because there's something, it seemed to me, also visual and um, very um, evocative of what is now going on about this particular image in the way that we see the face coming together, that many of the technical, technological um, ways we're now exploring the physical past um, is almost filmic, that we are now creating um, and using machinery which actually before our very eyes takes you stage by stage uh, through reconstruction. That these things are not isolated um, in result anymore but actually very much joined together. In this society we represent many disciplines um, and in the past it's often been one of the shibboleths of the way we talk about things to say that there was a time when art and science were really not divided in the way they seem to be today thanks to um, an education system which traditionally has done this and from the various interests have. If you look at a recent edition of our journal, you, how you cut through it, whether you do it by chronology, um, by um, explication of um, the way in which uh, people write about their material, whether it's a long or short article, whether we look across Britain or across the wider world, of course, the thing that joins us all together as art historians, architectural historians, archaeologists, um, people working on um, artifacts of the past, is that they will have something to say about the material that they're working on. And I mean the physical material, whether it's wood, glass, um, a wall on which something has been painted, whether it's the outside of a building, whether it's on uh, a canvas, um, a painting on wood, whether it's metal, iron or stone. This is the, it is that material substance which um, attracts us, which we feel we need to write about and qualify. And very often um, the results of technological analysis uh, are now incorporated into the way we write about these things, whether it's in a subsection or actually physically in the body of an argument. We spend a lot of time at the what I think of as the kind of refined or rarefied end of our material. It's history. Uh, we explore things like the iconography and the meaning of things, uh, and the meaning, therefore, for the society for which it was made. We look very, very carefully as antiquaries at its documentation at the time of its making, and usually as a way of establishing the origins um, and its use, um, the documentary history in the books, letters, and manuscripts of the period. And, of course, as antiquaries, we're fascinated, and quite rightly, by issues of provenance, where this object has been, whose hands has it passed through, and what documentation we have about that. Um, one of the issues, though, is very much now, I think, the, uh, the front end of, expo uh, of exploration often when we come across these objects is what we might call the science end of things, how we can examine these materials and their physical structure with the modern technological advances that we have. These things can establish date, they can establish things about the circumstances of um, their making, and often to something now about original context. Um, how was the um, object um, 
constructed? Was it fixed to something originally? Um, has, was it contained within something? Whose hands, indeed, did it pass through? Are there any residues of things on the object um, that tell us something about the past that we um, didn't know before? And, of course, beginning with the skull here um, tells us a great deal about skull technology or the interest in the skull. Human bones were, um, until uh, maybe about three-quarters of a century ago, something which yielded not very much because we were less interested in their physical makeup than we were in the discovery of the goods and artifacts that were around them in graves or in tomb structures. But now, of course, um, as this kind of thing demonstrates, we're now fascinated by the reconstruction of the human form and all kinds of other things about um, diet and things of the past that we can tell from the remains of, the, of um, people themselves. I start with a very celebrated picture, our Holbein in the National Gallery of uh, Jean de Dantefil and Georges de Selve, because, of course, um, when I mentioned that point at the beginning about art and science, here's the archetypal object from the period of the Renaissance, which tells us something of the range of skills and interests uh, of this time uh, would have had. Um, on the top shelf, uh, you will see there um, instruments for telling the time, um, for uh, judging the distances between ourselves and celestial forms, um, for reading things like climate and um, individual weather conditions. A series of objects used by people at the time which very much um, uh, reflected their interests in scientific examination. And on the lower uh, tier of the Great Holbein, there are things which are also scientific in the sense that they have something to say about the world. A globe centred, of course, uh, I I at the centre of it is a matter of policy in France for which this picture was originally made. Um, and um, the musical um, uh, and the lute reminding us of the arts of music. So... The picture is divided, upper and lower, into the traditional division of quadrivium and trivium that the um, uh, humanities and sciences at the time uh, were, um, were equally divided. So looking at objects like this and seeing that interest from one side of what has become a divide in modern times um, is very interesting. And as we look back through the past, this is... Um, my art historical um, uh, in, uh, contribution here, we can see that looking at those times when people specifically looked through, let's call it for the want of and using the most uh, obvious metaphor, the lens of science, um, was very much about exploring the world uh, with a scientific curiosity. Touch anything in 17th, from 17th century Holland, and this is obviously the case. Um, looking at the world uh, with the new inventions of telescope, um, of lenses, of looking at things that, uh, and making us think about the world we live in in very, very interesting and specific ways. The Van Straten peep show box, one of only three surviving in the world from this time and in the National Gallery, um, moves the viewer to very specific points where you have to look through a peephole, reminding us that actually we make decisions about how we see the world by the way in which we're standing and what the eye chooses to focus on um, and abstract or from the uh, uh, amount of things in front of it. And of course the tiny Fabricius painting in the lower half of this slide also in the National Gallery, patently by this strange sweeping street on the right-hand side, um, a view, uh, uh, in his view of Delft, uh, a, a, a piece of um, art that was obviously meant to be seen in some kind of viewing box which corrected um, the perspective, but makes us think too about the ways in which we put together the elements of the visual world. That interest in optics, and particularly centred um, on the School of Delft, is something that very much reflects that particular period and the interests um, of artists 
and their merchant clients at the time. Indeed, when we look at the paintings of Peter Dan, um, they are inconceivable without the use of very specific geometric instruments with which he could measure churches and regulate um, the site and the view that he's presenting to us. Um, this is by no means the most spectacular of San Redan's um, church interiors, but that sense that um, if you stepped into churches which he paints, you could not possibly, with the naked eye, see all of this at once. This is, a, this is an extended version by the use of instrumentation. And of course, what's so amazing and wonderful about things like this is that we can see a very direct correlation between the society which produced it and the physical object, because there's something about the whitewashed church, the whitewashed Protestant church, which suggests something that could almost be mapped out on the surface, as if it's done on a piece of graph paper, because there's very, very little impediment to the geometry of the architect now in front of us. Leonardo da Vinci worked for court environment for much of his life after he in his early years uh, working in Florence at the courts of Milan, partly at the papal court, brief visit to Venice. Um, and his studies of anatomy um, are very much determined by some of the great court commissions which he followed, but also his own curiosity to understand and get inside, as it were, the human form to help his artistic compositions. Um, and that too with, um, and here's an example of that, uh, directly related to the emergence of his ideas for Leder and the Swan, um, was his uh, thoughts on the male anatomy, what makes it work, what goes on inside the female body, in order to understand how he's going to paint um, via a series of drawings a representation of something which is about um, sexual congress, which is about generation, um, using the observable world, using um, his skills of observation to generate ideas for his narrative content. One of Leonardo's chief ideas about the natural world, of course, was out of the disorder around him, um, was a natural order of things. So people have often compared his studies of um, exploding rocks or of winds and waves with the curls and uh, features of the human head, of hair, as that across the natural world there are things which have a logic and which parallel each other and which give him an understanding of the ways in which um, the world uh, originated. And that, of course, passed across to the way in which he handled landscape um, in some of his key pictures. In the 18th century, um, George Stubbs, who of course studied anatomy at York, um, in the 1760s produced um, his Anatomy of the Horse. And it's very interesting that uh, what we see here is this skeletal form with its musculature and, and bone, um, enabling him to understand how the horse moves and how um, it is active. And what he said about this um, exercise in making this book of prints was this. What you have here is all I meant to do, it being as much as I thought necessary for the study of painting. I looked very little into the internal parts of a horse, my search here being only a matter of curiosity. So a search for the external appearance through understanding what's going on um, just under the skin in order for him to paint those vivid uh, scenes of horses um, in action. And most especially, um, pictures like this, the great whistle jacket um, in the National Gallery, which also is very much um, uh, part of its age because what he does here is to isolate the activity of the horse against this neutral, uh, neutral ground. Um, and I think we can very much see this, as many commentators have suggested, as part of that 18th century aspect of display. This was a great picture painted amongst several by Stubbs for the Marquis of Rock Rockingham, which will be seen 
uh, alongside or adjacent to galleries of sculpture, that isolation of modern or classical sculpture against the neutral wall so that the, the form and the figure is studied is what he's doing here um, for the horse. So absolutely about its time, about its purpose, and using the cry of scientific examination to produce works of art. And I wanted to end this section with um, Dice's Pegwall Bay uh, in the Tate, because it seems to me um, that uh, it's uh, a, a, an extraordinary picture in terms of its timing, um, because he was painting this in 1815, and I don't need to remind this audience of that crucial date um, in, our, um, in the history of, um, of the evolution of science. And the way in which Dice here uh, represents um, and tries to encapsulate the difference between human time and geological time. Um, his wife and her sisters are uh, searching amongst the rocks in the foreground, whilst in the background are the chalk cliffs, which date from whenever. Um, 1859 was perhaps to change uh, a perception of when all this could first have come into being. And in the sky, representing, as it were, celestial time, the representation, you can just see it, um, thanks to um, sharper photographs that we had 30 years ago. Some one of the early articles I read on this said that photographs almost didn't represent it. But up there at the top, Donati's comet appearing um, and not then about to reappear, I think, for something like uh, we're expecting it back in, well, from 1859, some 1,200 years. Um, the critical reaction to this uh, picture uh, very much, I think, showed the way in which people saw it as a strange evocation of time and place, not a sunny landscape, not a sunny beach scene of the kind that many Victorians were painted or that the great naturalist landscapes of the early 19th century have presented to us. Someone said, um, it is as if a man had come to the ugly end of the world and felt um, it had to be told. Um, this quiet, grey solitude of the moment, um, making us think, as I said, about and celestial time. Um, picture, and as I said, also something painted in 1859, exhibited at the Academy in 1860, very much to do um, with the kinds of things um, that are about to be revolutionized and changed with the publication of The Origin of Species. How is the society involved uh, explorations in, in the broadest aspect of the word science and its new technologies? Well, one thing we do, of course, as has already been mentioned today, is through our grants, and grants in particular for research. I'm here going, as it were, to the high end of the market, um, the detail from the Constantine and Justinian mosaic in Hagia Sophia, to make a point about these um, gold glass tesserae that you see surrounding the figure there, and indeed um, on the clothes as well. One of the things that the Society has supported recently was the investigation um, by XRF um, X-ray uh, fluorescence of um, some finds of gold glass tesserae associated with the uh, villa of uh, Southwick in Sussex. Now, uh, we don't know for sure, because the documentation isn't secure, how these uh, particular tesserae arrived at um, the two museums from which they've come. They're very small museums without much documentation of the past. Um, and Southwick is one of those places which uh, traditionally is often said to be somewhere where if there were ever gold tesserae made in Britain um, in the late antique period, this was one of the places they might have come from. So the project here that we have supported is to um, examine the um, lead content of these fragments, supposedly from a mosaic in Southwick, to determine whether in fact they are Roman. And the results of this will be published in the next edition of the journal. So I'll leave you to wait expectantly for that. So supporting research 
through our research grants is a way in which we try to make sure that uh, research goes on, that um, particular things which need technological support that usually can be costed very, very precisely as opposed to those projects where people are searching in archives many years in the future, um, can often provide results very quickly. That's one way in which society is and can be involved uh, with such projects. But there is, of course, uh, a way in which we've traditionally been um, always interested in these things. And I put up again our illustration from our 2007 exhibition um, and also exhibited in America at Boston and Yale um, in 2011 to 12. The Hoxney uh, Flint, discovered um, in 1797, um, and the drawing made of it by Thomas Underwood, um, which uh, was very much uh, a way, it seemed to me, when, uh, when one looks at this, of thinking of this object and drawing it very precisely in order to, as it were, turn it in the eye, as if one were turning it in, in the hand, and to make sure that we notice the particular faceting and particular aspects of this, of this object. Famously, the Hoxney flint and the discoveries around it at this time marked something of a new level of archaeological exploration because the various levels of deposit were very carefully identified um, uh, and seemed to underpin uh, work going on at that time to prove that these things were not meteorites or things that have fallen to, to earth, but actually um, uh, were uh, created by human agency because of the um, human remains which were found at various levels um, of the archaeological exploration. So our work here and our um, uh, careful conservation of this object in the years since and our exhibiting it is very much part of the society's history of uh, this kind of exploration and the very careful way in which we record that past. Also from the exhibition, of course, um, the which were then very recent. We have to remind ourselves that things have moved on. Um, at the time of the exhibition in 2007, these um, laser scans were just a few years old. We're already reaching you know, a decade past, um, and things have moved on. But our um, role in really since our foundation in the exploration of Stonehenge through uh, archaeology there that we've sponsored, through the work of our fellows up to that of very recent times of Jeff Wainwright um, and others um, who have um, taken the ideas about Stonehenge forward. Now, of course, we have new ways of looking at the site. Um, on the top left, the laser scan of the, uh, uh, taken from the air, which of course is, is able to show us things that were um, hitherto unseen. And on the bottom right, um, the laser scan of stone 53, showing there in a way that you can't see with the naked eye, the um, um, arrowheads and the uh, graffiti or carvings on these, the lettering on these, um, which are barely discernible ways in which, through scientific investigation, we can record the past, but also find new evidence from things we thought we knew rather well. Another way that we're striking ahead, of course, and again we've heard a little of this today, is through the conservation of our picture collection and the ways in which the examination of our pictures has yielded new things which are, are adding to the fabric um, and the um, pattern that we're beginning to see across other projects taking place or things that have taken place in recent years in other institutions, um, particularly to do with the art of the 15th and 16th centuries. I'm thinking of the project Tate, um, conducted uh, by our fellow Rika Jones and current work at the National Trade Gallery. Looking hard at pictures, uh, using the techniques we have now to examine them obviously yield extraordinary results. Um, simply in the realms of um, 
uh, doing macro photography. Here's a detail from the 1614, um, sometimes attributed uh, to Marcus Girard's portrait of Lady Scudamore, is a macro image um, um, of the flowers around the wreath which um, accompanies the portrait, where simply by looking at that, we get insights into the way in which the artist tackled um, this um, tackled and used his materials uh, very, very explicitly in the ways that it's very difficult otherwise to see. And another uh, portrait gallery picture here, portrait of Nicholas Heath, with the um, showing here of um, x-rays, uh, showing up the ways in which you can see um, underdrawing um, and the ways in which um, artists would have prepared their pictures uh, for the final um, painting. Um, sometimes, uh, but very rarely in England, but in other countries in Europe, we have um, working drawings which lead up to this point, so we can see the difference between compositional ideas and the final working up of the painting. Various ways in which what's happening beneath these things becomes increasingly apparent to us. And that's the thing that, going back to what I said at the beginning, increasingly exciting, because I was hearing just last week of instrumentation now that don't, doesn't just record particular things and infrareds and x-rays will show you particularly different things about the under uh, drawing and the other layers of paint within a picture, but instrumentation now which will filmically show you the layers one after the other, build up the picture before your very eyes um, as it penetrates the surface and records and takes you on a journey, as it were, right down to the way in the very beginnings of the making um, of the picture. Our pictures are contributing to this. In um, uh, sight here of our picture of Henry VII, um, uh, of uh, the early um, uh, 16th century, um, where, of course, here we found that the infrared that was done on this picture as part of its conservation um, suggests that this picture was, part, um, was partly made by uh, pouncing the surface. Um, that's to say by um, laying a cartoon on the, on, the, on the wooden panel, pricking the surface from the, around the drawing, and then making, uh, uh, um, uh, using um, uh, the um, black charcoal dust to record image through those pinpricks, a way of using the cartoon actually um, And also suggesting, of course, that uh, cartoons may have been used for more than one version of these pictures. And that's increasingly what we're finding with these, um, with these uh, portrait images, that uh, there may be one special one made for, to go on one particular foreign embassy or one particular journey that be made, but then other copies were made for the internal uh, as well as the external market. And of course also within sight here, um, the portraits of Edward IV and Richard III, which came separately into Kerich's collection, but thanks to dendrochronology um, on the wood, we know were uh, actually cut from the same tree. Um, this uh, therefore suggests, as we, as we have always supposed, that these were part of a set, given the comparability of the lettering on them and the way they are physically made with their attached frames, that these belong together. Though a warning here, um, it's not always the case that um, things that are cut from the same tree all go to the same workshop. The National Portrait Gallery um, is finding that there are things which physically must have gone to very, very different workshops, even um, across time, um, where wood um, seems to have come from the same tree. But I, I think surely in this case we can say these were painted together, got separated, and miraculously um, ended up in the same collection and are with us together today. Pictures like this too, um, and the way in which they come together, and the way in which conservation enables us to look at the backs and examine the wood, examine the fixings, and do macro photography of those things, help us also to understand 
are what we also have long supposed, that many of these pictures may have been made for very specific localities. We're used to thinking of sets of portraits as being things that are um, moved around, um, often given frames, um, and redisplayed in some of the rooms, and especially the long galleries of later houses. But many of these 15th and 16th century sets do seem increasingly to have been made for a very, very fixed position. And one day we may be able to do work, other than the very um, adequate but basic conservation we've done so far, on the remains of our set um, of Saxon kings, because we do need to discover with what I've always thought is a really extraordinary, precious set of remains, because there's no other uh, set of remains, um, a set of objects that were certainly all made uh, for one particular place to be read alongside each other, and one day we may well be able, uh, by looking at those uh, very carefully, to envisage um, a whole scheme of things um, along a wall, and possibly for a very um, important and significant setting. The mention of dendrochronology uh, brings me to buildings and uh, to my last section here, where, um, importantly, as we've already focused on today, to end up um, at Kelmscott Manor. Um, I was privileged to be involved in several schemes um, of, um, uh, uh, alongside archaeologists working on the history of great Tudor houses. Um, and one of the things that's come into focus much more uh, across that century is, and I'm talking here in very general terms because every site, of course, throws up very, very different um, uh, issues, is that many houses where we thought uh, by looking at the external fabric or looking at the um, intimations from the documentation that this all must have taken several generations to build or um, that the um, uh, son of the original owner must have added on this wing or whatever. Um, sometimes the dendrochronological uh, analysis has revealed that, in fact, um, we have uh, something we should always have suspected here, a very, very specific and um, very um, uh, rapid uh, building campaign. That was certainly true of this house, the Vine, in Hampshire, where it was clear um, from the examination of this house, and if you look in these at the um, red which runs through those four plans of Thela, um, ground floor, first floor, and um, floor, the um, red uh, other remains of the Tudor house, uh, to which... Uh, 17th century and then later 19th century additions were made, but from one end of the house to the other, from the oak gallery there on the left on the upper floor to the chapel on the right-hand side, um, it does seem from the dendro analysis um, that the um, making of this house uh, all took place within a very short space of time, a space of time probably within about two years. So William Sand's building here is all of one um, build, um, immediately after the time when he rose to the highest phase of um, his office holding at court, and just after he was made um, uh, a, a member of the peerage. The same proved to be true of the later Tudor house of Parham, which we had always thought incorporated medieval remains um, at one end. Um, uh, we're here um, looking at the house uh, from the eastern, uh, sorry, the western side. Um, the kitchen area, which, which had thicker walls and therefore was perhaps part of something from medieval times. But again, working through the roof spaces and looking at the timbers and uh, getting a dating for them through the dendro, seems to show that the house was um, largely completed in a very short space of time in the 1570s. That doesn't mean to say that subsequent generations of the family, and after it was sold out of the um, initial Palmer family, didn't do a lot of the fitting out of these houses in the last years of Elizabeth's reign and into the reign of James. But again, a rapid building project. 
something which now, through this kind of examination which we can now do, taking a number of points of reference along the whole run of the house, gives us a sense um, that this was something um, like other houses that was built in a very short space of time and gives us a sense of uh, a, a better grip um, on what would have gone on here. And so to Kelmscott, um, you heard earlier about the ways in which uh, we have challenges at Kelmscott. First of all, to make sure that we keep visitor numbers up, that we um, make Kelmscott um, really try and support itself through its activities. It's doing well through the shop, um, but we need to keep um, working at that, and we need to, to um, make sure that we um, encourage more visitors and more financial support through our uh, friend scheme, which we're launching this year. Um, but also, I would say, given you know, other times and donations and bequests, there is work, obviously, still to be done on the physical fabric of the house to investigate a bit more about how it's put together um, and the various phases of its construction. Um, particularly the differences between those two uh, major early modern um, building phases of its life, as was brought out in the book published um, six years ago um, on the house uh, and its uh, essential development. It was in the early 1960s, of course, that the society took over Kelmscott in um, 1904, um, and um, uh, it was during those years that uh, the house was investigated and photographed, but as Nicholas Cooper uh, pointed out um, in his article in the book, it wasn't the time when very much uh, there was such pressure to um, shore the house up and to make sure it was, it was um, uh, fit for purpose again, uh, somewhere that could be open to the public and was waterproof, um, not enough attention was paid, perhaps at that time, to doing some architectural and historical analysis of bringing documentation, etc., to bear on what was discovered um, um, in the uh, restoration of the house at that period. One of the extraordinary things, of course, that was discovered was the extraordinary um, Serlian um, floor under the tapestry room, this um, uh, photograph of it. Um, in that part of the house, the tapestry room, of course, in that part of the house, the aggrandizing of the house in the 1660s. We call it a Serlian floor because at one remove, and it's nothing like as complicated as the um, Serlio design, but it is, of course, Serlio who first suggests, in printed form anyway, um, and gives a plan of a scheme by you span a whole base um, by very short uh, bits of timber dropped together. One of the most spectacular examples of this is under the floor of the great chamber um, above the hall at um, Woolerton Hall in Nottinghamshire. It clearly was something that for a century and more after the publication of Serlio in the 1540s um, had uh, an enormous influence uh, across Europe when great um, spans or lengths of wood uh, rather were not possibly um, available. Um, and that we think, too, that the builder of the house at this time um, must have known the um, civilian uh, professor of geometry at Oxford, who provided the um, details of the plates for Robert Plot's Natural History of Oxfordshire in um, 1677, published in 1677, when, um, where one such floor is thereby displayed in the top right-hand corner. So uh, there is room at Kelmscott when we've got time, energy and commitment, when perhaps one day, and here again a plug for fundraising, one of the great challenges at Kelmscott is those tapestries in the tapestry room some time are going to have to be conserved. Uh, it will be very costly, but when they come out, when that room is um, itself conserved, maybe even put back to as it was in Morris's day when... Um, Rossetti used it as a studio, um, as two rooms. Um, this may be time again to look at this floor and find out uh, more about it. But of course, it's 
wider than that, and though we've already mentioned today um, the sense that um, there's lots to do at Kelmscott in terms of the exploration, not just of the, um, of the house, but of the landscape around it. Um, some of this was done, some of this was adumbrated, certainly by the time of the publication six years ago, by the surveys that have been done of the um, uh, uh, flora around the house, of the natural landscape of the mapping of that landscape more accurately than had been done before with um, all the um, instrumentation then available. By the time we get back to this, we'll be able to do more. Um, this very much, I think, is the future of the site. Um, not simply, perhaps, to create only a visitor experience which needn't even penetrate the house, though one must expect that many people from across the world are coming to see those William Morris remains inside, but building up things like the, the Friends Scheme and encouraging people to come back to take people out into the landscape and giving them information about garden and landscape which enriches the visitor experience. There's much to do there which can use this seminal point of reference for us, as the General Secretary said, not only in terms of William Morris, his belief in conservation and all that that stood for, but also in the wonderful setting of this house, which tells us much, I think, about um, uh, the landscape um, of our countryside. So uh, I, I, I want to end there, but I will end by saying that this today has been a peroration for me very much trying to look at the ways in which um, scientific analysis, close analysis of things, sometimes with instrumentation, sometimes with the human eye, has enriched the experience of the um, uh, artistic input into um, these great works of art that I've passed us through. Um, it's also, I hope, explored some of those things and looked at things for the future. Um, next year, I think we get down to a different kind of serious business because I'm minded that next year, amongst many, I think, debates we'll have here and elsewhere, there is something to be said about the national picture, given the sense of nationhood that we'll be exploring and indeed challenging and having to think about very much next year. And it is that idea of what the society has done to build up the national picture of our material past and what that identifies about both the country as a whole and the constituent part of Britain um, that I will want to give some attendance to um, in a year's time. Thank you very much. Very honoured a year ago. Not that it was; it was completely unplanned. But of course, I, I 